Hello, Sir Survivor here. And today I want to talk about the coronavirus. I want to look at some of the numbers, uh, some of the people that are infected, do a little math, and let's, let's see what this is really looking like. We hear a lot of information on the news, and depending on which networks you watch and which websites you go to, this information will vary greatly. So we're going to look at one site in particular today. And this is a site called the Worldometer. And on this particular site, I'm looking at the coronavirus page. Now, we've heard a lot about uh, people saying that, you know, those who are not in the best physical condition, the older population, the younger children who haven't developed their immune systems fully, and people with pre-existing conditions are the most susceptible to this disease. But then again, that's true about any disease out there. So I feel like some of it is being downplayed, although I do believe that, you know, we're going to get a hold on this, or I really hope we do. Uh, but let's look at some of the numbers here. On this site, it's got some really good information. We see the total number of cases here. The number of those cases that resulted in the patients being in severe condition. The deaths, the total deaths so far, and the number of people who have recovered. But what we want to talk about today are these numbers and what they really mean and see what kind of a risk that we're really at. Then we'll talk about what we can do to prepare and survive for an event like this should it reach the stage of a global pandemic to where every nation is, you know, affected by it. So looking at this site, we can see there's a lot of valuable information here. It breaks everything down by country and it's updated frequently. It's updated several times a day. So we get to see the, you know, almost real time effects of it. But first, let's start up here. And this is what I really wanted to talk about is these are cases, what we have to really put this into perspective is these are cases that are being studied in hospitals right now. These are cases that people know about, and these are cases that are receiving medical treatment. Now, as this gets worse, then we're going to start running low on medical supplies. Hospitals will start turning people away, and this, these cases in severe condition and the number of deaths is going to, in my opinion, skyrocket once it reaches that point. So let's do a little math right here and look and see. They say that the mortality rate is 2%. So 2% of the people who catch the disease are likely to die from it. Now, with that being said, that's also in an environment like we're in right now. And that's where medical care is accessible to everyone pretty much. I know that in China right now, they're, they're on a quarantine. They got about 60 million people quarantined basically or locked down. So the medical treatment is getting a little more difficult, even though they've built two new hospitals recently that we've seen on all of the networks. But there will come a point to where the medical care is stretched so thin that these cases will increase due to the fact that they're being turned away by the hospitals and told to self-quarantine. And then we have to look at human nature. Of the people who do have to self-quarantine, there's going to be a percentage of those that do not, that still go out in public and spread the disease even further, whether intentional or unintentional. But with a 2% mortality rate, I look more along the lines of these numbers compared to the deaths, the severe condition compared to the number of deaths, not the total total cases, because that's misleading in a way, at least to me. Um, it's misleading because these people are receiving good medical treatment. What we have to look at is the ones who do reach the severe condition, the ones who do become severe, how many of those people will, you know, result in death? So let's do the math on this. So if we have 815 total deaths divided by the number of people who have reached the severe condition level, 6,198, then we see a percentage of about 13.14%. So this is basically saying 13% of people who reach the severe condition stage um, it may result in death for them. And that's the number I worry about. And I'll tell you why. It's because without proper medical treatment, we only have so many hospitals, but we have seven and a half billion people in the world. So we do not have enough hospital beds to treat even 10% of that worldwide. So if this does spread on a much larger scale, what you're going to see is a lot more people reaching the severe condition because they cannot get the supplies they need. They're being turned away from the hospitals or they simply cannot make it there. And that's going to dramatically increase the number of deaths we see due to the fact that there will be less medication available and there will be less treatments available. Now, hopefully the uh, World Health Organization and all of the doctors and scientists working together worldwide right now will be able to find something to stop this. 
But just like in the past, there was no cure for SARS. There was no cure for MERS. There was no cure for the common cold. We can only treat the symptoms. And we can treat the symptoms and quarantine the vic victims, and hopefully the, you know, the threat will pass. And that's what we're looking at right now. There's no cure for this. There's no real treatment that stops this disease in its tracks. We're simply treating the symptoms and hoping it'll pass. And for a lot of people, it is not. And as we can see here, 13% of those who do reach severe condition will result in death. Let's look at some of the other numbers. Uh, I like this site because it, it does update in real time. It shows you graphical representations here, which I personally like. There's a pretty good chart on it that breaks it down country by country, number of deaths, number of new cases. But there are also some information down here. And this was the 2% fatality rate that they're talking about. And what we're looking at 2% is 2% of the total cases here. So if we do the math on that, we'll see basically the same thing. It will be 2%. We have 815 deaths divided by 37,609, 2.16%. But we have to realize that these, these numbers will go up when medical treatment goes down, when the hospitals are basically at their maximum capacity and can't take any more patients. Another thing we have to take into consideration, and this is probably uh, one of the most troubling aspects of this disease, and that's what's called the R0 factor. So if we look closer at this, as we can see here, the reproductive number is called R0 or R0, and that's just how it's denoted. And depending on which sources you look at, this study is as high as 4.08, and that's risen tremendously from the estimates in January of 1.4 to 2.5. What this means is, for every one person that has this disease, that they will pass it on to an average of, if we go with that number, 4.08 or four other people. So if one person infects four people, those four people infect four more each. We're already looking at 16 cases that originated from one person. And then those 16 infect four more each. Now we're looking at 64 cases. So it, it'll grow exponentially if this is not kept in check. A lot of information on this site, and I, I, I urge everybody to take a look at it and read it. It's got a lot of links to a lot of other valuable information about this. So what happens if this isn't stopped? What happens if it isn't stopped? Well, it's not spreading outside of China as rapidly as it's spreading in China, and that's because that's ground zero for this disease. Now, when this does spread beyond the capacity of their government to, to contain it, then what you're going to see is people migrating out of the country in an attempt to flee this disease. And we can talk about, you know, you can't cross borders and all that, but it's going to happen when it gets that bad. And that's how it's going to end up spreading worldwide, possibly. And once this goes so far, imagine yourself right now in Wuhan, China, um, where the quarantine is. And these people are under basically martial law at this point. This is pretty severe over there from what I've read. Of course, I haven't been there. But from what I've read and what I've seen, then it's on lockdown. And imagine that situation here. Imagine it worldwide. When things do go on lockdown, at first, we're not going to see a major breakdown of social services. But it's just a matter of time. We can't continue operating our society the way we do with the majority of people quarantined in their homes. If it spreads that wide, if it becomes a global pandemic, then what we're looking at is the eventual breakdown of a lot of social services. You're going to have people who aren't prepared because as much as the people that are watching this video and myself, we're prepared for bug-in situations. We're prepared to stay in our home and stay here for long periods of time if necessary without even leaving the home. But most people are not. Probably 80% of the population would be my guess, maybe as high as 90, are not prepared to last longer than two or three days in their home. And what happens when their food runs out? And when their food runs out, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to come looking for food. And if the stores are not open, they're going to come to us looking for food. And that's going to be a dangerous situation at that point. So, of course, here I'm not talking about the best case scenario. The best case scenario is they find a cure tomorrow and it's all wiped out and we're good to go. I'm just looking at what happens if it does get worse. So let's talk a little bit about some things that we could do to prepare for this type of event. But first, here are some graphics from the World Health Organization. Just some tidbits of information here that may help us out. I'm going to put them on the screen for about 5 to 10 seconds each. So you may need to pause the videos to, to read the entire graphic. 
and then we'll get into the gear and the preparations we can make to keep ourselves and our families safe in this situation. Here's some things we can do to prepare or hopefully check off on our list that we already have prepared and that will be ready for a long term bug in situation in case of isolation or quarantine due to the rise of this disease. One of the first things is uh, some types of masks or gloves and suits. And what I'm talking about there is you hear a lot of talk about the N95 gas mask and I hear these on online people are pushing these all the time and they're saying this is what you need, get these and wear them. And, you know, that's true. It's better to have something as opposed to nothing. Uh, the World Health Organization and other groups are saying if you don't have the disease, it's not really necessary to wear this mask around. But if you do have it, you want to wear it at all times to avoid spreading the disease. But our eyes, we have to protect our eyes also. And our eyes can be protected with goggles or some type of face shield, depending on what types of devices you have. Now, for most people staying in their home, uh, this may not even be an issue. But put yourself in this situation. One person in your home does have the disease. So having this gear, having these, this equipment to be able to protect yourself and, and to keep them from spreading, to, spreading this disease to other people in the home, this is a very necessary option. Myself, I, I like a real gas mask if I'm going to go out in public and I feel like there's a threat, some type of contamination, no matter what it is, biological, chemical, uh, fallout, it doesn't matter. I'm going to wear a full gas mask, but that's just me and not everyone has the means to go out and buy an expensive gas mask. So whatever you can use, like the N95, don't go lower than that, but use those in anything higher as far as respiratory protection because this will, this will help you from contracting the disease and if you do have it or if anyone does have it, then it'll help you from spreading it to the ones that you care about. Also, full body protective suits. The Tyvek suits and things like that, these are good for keeping debris off of your body. Um, I'm not sure that they're going to be rated to withstand viruses, but some, once again, something's better than nothing. But what you have to realize about this type of stuff, the N95 masks and these Tyvek suits, is that these are basically one-time deals. You're going to wear these once and you're going to throw them away. They're too cheap, they're too flimsy to try to wash, to try to clean, so you're basically going to throw them away. Some may opt to go with a uh, total decontamination suits and such. And if you have the means, the money, then that's definitely the best option. But at least have some protection to protect you and your family. And this basically, if you're going to have to venture out into town uh, while this outbreak is going on, and if it's that bad, then you may want to invest in some of these. Putting on a Tyvek suit, wearing rubber gloves, wearing rubber boots over your clothing, and tucking the gloves and the boots inside the suit and sealing off your arm cuffs and your legs with duct tape, uh, making sure that they're completely airtight to avoid any penetration of a virus or similar. Two are sanitizers and cleaners. Although this may not seem very important at first, but it's good to keep bleach and other type of alcohol-based cleaners on hand because these will be used to clean your hands. They will be used to clean the surfaces in your home. They'll be used to disinfect anything that you might think is infective. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be very important to keep a sterile or clean environment in your home to prevent this from happening to you in any way. Another thing that may not seem as important is uh, plastic sheeting. Now get some good thick plastic sheeting and this can be used for multiple things. One of the things that these plastic sheets can be used for is to simply seal off your windows, seal off your doors if necessary if it were to get that bad. Or if you have someone in your home that does have the disease, then you can seal off the area that they're in to help prevent the transmission of this disease as best you can. Another another use for this is if you do have to venture out into the city, the gear that you wear out, you're not going to want to wear this gear into your house. You'll be spreading the disease throughout your home then. So you can create a small little contamination room either outside of your home or inside of your home by using this plastic sheeting to basically box in a small area. And this will allow the person that's coming from the outside to get undressed basically from all their gear, disinfect their gear, and then enter the home. Next is food. 
Food uh, is pretty straightforward. Um, if we're really going to prep for a bug in event, in the three days that's recommended by FEMA and all, that just isn't going to cut it. We're going to need 30 to 60 days supply of food for everyone in that home. And this can be done with canned goods, survival food. There's so many different methods, so many different products out there available that it makes this choice actually very easy. Uh, this is one of the easier things to acquire, although, you know, 30 to 60 days of food can be a little bit on the expensive side. But as far as me being able to get it today, I can go out today and I can purchase that. So having a food, high calorie food, that's going to last you and your family for at least 30 to 60 days. Water purification or water storage. This just basically boils down to the individual. Some people will store water. They'll buy containers and they'll store the water themselves. And that's great if you have those means, if that's available to you. But for those that don't, then you're going to have to look into water purification methods. Water purification filters. Remember, you can use bleach to purify water. Four drops of bleach per gallon. Make sure you shake it pretty well and let it sit. But also, there are multiple devices on the market for sale. Uh, multiple multiple things that we can use to purify our water, to filter our water, and then purify it. And there's always the old-fashioned way of boiling the water, too. So we want to make sure we have at least a plan and means for water purification. It's a good idea to keep some type of external power supply, whether this be a generator, whether it be some solar panels, or simply a very large stockpile of batteries for your devices, because you're going to want to be able to keep in touch with society. You're going to want to make sure if the spread of the disease were to get so bad that it infects, you know, a large portion of the population, then a lot of the workers who normally, you know, run the power stations, maybe they make it to work, maybe they don't. And even if they do, if a storm comes through or anything and there's a loss of power somewhere, it's probably not going to be restored until this situation is over. So having a means to be able to power your devices, and maintain at least some type of power supply is something that would be very necessary. Money. It's always a good idea to keep money on hand basically all the time. But in this situation, you know, money is going to be very important. And the reason for that is the items that we can go to the store and buy right now, cold, you know, cold medicine, flu medicine, things like that, are average price. But in this type of ep epidemic or maybe even pandemic, then these prices are going to skyrocket due to the demand. So what might be $5 today could be 50 tomorrow, maybe even 500 So having money on hand to be able to buy the supplies you need is something that may be an absolute necessity. Hygiene products. Hygiene products are, in my opinion, very important. If you are bugging in for a long period of time, 30 to 60 days until everything passes, then you don't want to bug in and have no toothpaste and you know, run out run out of mouthwash, run out of deodorant. Um, that's just going to create a more unsanitary condition. So it's just important to maintain hygiene supplies that can last you for that amount of time as it is some of the other supplies because keeping ourselves clean is a big part of keeping ourselves healthy. Medical supplies. Medical supplies, in addition to your standard first aid kits, you know, just looking at the things we will want to add to it, there's really no known cure for this disease, so there's nothing we can go out and buy and take that's going to cure us if we get it or prevent us from getting it. The best thing we can do is keep on hand things that will treat the symptoms of it, and this is our strong cold and flu medicines, our cough suppressants, our decongestants, any type of medications that would normally treat flu-like symptoms or cold-like symptoms, then these are going to be medications you want to keep on hand. It wouldn't hurt to stock up on a few extra now, although, you know, a lot of them don't have an extremely long lifetime. We're in the middle of this now, so having these supplies, they don't have to last 10 years. They only have to last a few months because in a few months we'll either know whether this breaks us or we survive. And one of the last things, but in the later stages of a global pandemic, one of the most important aspects will be self-defense. The ability, the means to protect yourself and protect your family. When the food supplies run low, when the medicine runs low, when social services break down, then people are going to come knocking. And when they do, you got to be ready because if you're not, then that may be the end of you. It might not be the virus that gets you. It might be your neighbor. So we have to be ready to defend ourselves and defend our home at any time and at any cost. Everyone has their own uh, preferences to means of self-defense, and this isn't a self-defense video, so I'm not going to go into all that. But we all know that firearms, bladed weapons, these are something that we should have. 
Now, there's obviously a lot more to prepping than what we just talked about. I was just looking at things that, you know, someone who maybe wasn't familiar with it, they could have a pretty good idea of how to at least get started with this. There is so much more that can be added to this list and things that you think of, please leave in the comments below for me and for everyone else to read because we're just trying to help each other here. So hopefully this helps out. Uh, I'll put links in the description to a lot of the things that are referenced here and check them out. You know, there's some good reads there and some good information. Uh, hopefully this will blow over and chances are it may, but chances are it may not. And we'll just have to wait and see. I was going to do a cold weather video this weekend, a cold weather bug out bag. But as I got to put my bag together, I realized that I had several items that I still needed to go purchase. So I'll be doing that next weekend. Today, I just wanted to talk about this and just put it in perspective as far as like the percentages that we see on the news networks. We know the government's main goal is to keep the you know people from panicking, from worrying. That's one of the things they're trying to do is keep us from panicking. And the way they do that is by sort of skewing these numbers a little bit. Um, we looked at the math in the beginning. So I hope that you enjoyed the video. I hope that it helps. And for now, Sears Survivor out.